Hello everyone, today we introduce a veritable colossus in military history, Pyrrhus, king of the Pyrrhus, actually king of the Molossians before that, of the Ayakia uh, dynasty, uh, and, um, an incredibly relevant figure already in life, uh, is considered as one of the first, um, at least first attested European thaumaturgic rulers, uh, a man who was nicknamed the Eagle for his military accomplishments, who fought against um, uh, generals of Alexander's time, brother-in-law uh, of Demetrius Polyorchetus, uh, also son-in-law of Agathocles of Syracuse, just to speak about the, the generally political and military background with which he was elevated, a man who heroically distinguished himself in hand-to-hand -hand combat till his ultimate, as actually, uh, and ironically, in famous demise, and that, in fact, is, in spite of all these achievements, remembered mostly from being a, a great defeated uh, in history, but especially, and uh, quite interestingly, in the history of the art of war, are defeated by victory, as it's exemplified also by the proverbial term attributed to such achievement. That is to say, a pyrrhic victory, one that basically has cost more to the winner than the defeated. Um, nickname that we mostly, as anecdotally, refer to the alleged uh, phrase that the Epirote ruler would have uttered after the, in fact, the, the Epirote victory at Ausculum against the Romans, but that, knowing his entire life, is definitely uh, more um, metaphysical in nature. I mean, this is a ruler who struggled, essentially, throughout his entire existence to not just maintain control at the point of the same Epirus, but conquering and ruling Macedon, uh, Greece. Uh, he uh, tried to essentially establish a Western dominion that could be used as, as a sort of launching pad to, in fact, uh, overrun Hellas, and from there repeat the deeds of Alexander, that, by the way, was a second cousin of his, as uh, Olympia was... Uh, in fact, uh, his uh, first cousin, uh, and that failed instead, failed by winning, uh, at least uh, up to the end against the Romans, uh, winning also the Carthaginians in Sicily that had sought um, the same Pyrrhus protection to fight the Punics, and that basically stopped supporting the Hellenistic ruler in the moment he was about to sweep uh, the entirety of Sicily, of the Carthaginian presence, um, and, in fact, a figure that finally managed to take over Macedon and uh, invade Greece, dying in the overall siege of uh, Sparta in the fights of the streets of Argos, right, till thing, uh, arri having arrived at a point where he also lost his son, by the way, during the same campaign, so perfectly incarnating the limits and the general difficulties of the the Adokoi in the wake of Alexander to being able to manage that enormous uh, mil military machine that the Magus and his father had created and that ended in a sort of uh, scholarization or statisticization of the same successors' realms, and that would also be ultimately taken over by an apparently much more primitive, yet more effective system like the, the Roman one, for reasons that would take, uh, in fact, more than the video that I already made on the comparison between the Manipular Legion and the uh, Macedonian phalanx um, to, to properly explain in a sort of broader political, moral uh, and cultural point of view, right? Certain things we can already, of course, hint at. I also made a video about the Hellenistic art of war, 
right, an introduction to the topic, as um, I think that it, it is not just a, a very fascinating subject, but also one that has been a bit mythologized, especially in the last uh, 10 years or so with the spread of lots of, you know, communities connected with even video gaming, think about Total War, I have lots of, of course, people of my generation were fully, in, say, in the eye of that specific storm. Um, but there are some myths that have been fabricated, at least as a broader historical narrative or um, a historiograph, uh, say, a, a misinterpretation of the same historiographical one that should be framed. I was talking about it also in an interview that I made recently that will hopefully be aired uh, in in a short time from now. Um, the a lack of a truly comparative approach to the art of war, meaning that, for example, as a medievalist, I am burningly passionate with Hellenistic warfare. I've always been, as you know, as far as also the, the Roman one and, and beyond, Schwerpunkt's philosophy is quite clear. Here we cover the entirety of military history because you couldn't understand individual elements of each uh, time and place otherwise. Instead, it seems to me at least that the general prevalence is just sticking to some sort of, you know, I just prefer one of these and that's fine, but I like, sort of eventually simply stick to that and pretend that the rest does not exist or I don't understand uh, its important, its importance in historical perspective. Uh, and so I tend to fossilize, to sclerotize a bit like the same we are very much uh, children of the Greeks from a, from a mental point of view, the same Hellenistic armies, right, in the sense of achievement of, okay, well, I can understand everything, knowing all if I want, but I will just relax and stick to this because, after all, that's the cool topic or this is what other people talk about and then you ignore also the more systemic uh, ones, right? Uh, as I often say recently, I, I saw that uh, flourishing of... Ah, the apolitic heresy. Videos with hundreds of thousands of views, like lasting, I don't know, 12 minutes, pretending to, you know, uh, enlighten, which d doesn't make, doesn't take much, telling the truth, sort of the average person about uh, this historiographical debate that is a an actual non-problem, because any person who has studied uh, thoroughly ancient, uh, say at least in that case, classical Hellenic warfare in some sort, even just reconstructing some battles and you know reading some book and being, of course, equipped with the necessary military historical uh, capacity. Uh, in fact, does not need to hear, right? It's not uh, like you know if uh, uh, an academic world sclerotizes on. Um, say internal say obsession for internal self reference whatever is, is spoken in that narrow side of the eye is not known by other people uh, that may have simply spotted that it, it's actually a known problem it's, it's not even about the subject matter of classical Hellenic warfare that, that's the actual problem study campaigns and battles not study what scholars say about them right especially in this case um, sources are relatively few for you to focus on them in a logical way uh, without the subsidium of some or other sort of strange temporary historiographical fashions and or aberrations, right? Um, these are the kind of people making make videos on this topic but can't even address it themselves and or say the warfare of any other people around at the same time. On Schwerpunkt we do in fact exactly this um, and or something extremely different because of course it does take time to cover everything but it's not like you can simply focus on what seems to be what a person without any particular background would like to hear and clothe in it uh, in the form of some strange uh, ah look I, I you know pull out the, the, the rabbit from the hat for topics that are at the end of the day so bad I mean they're not banal but they become banal when they are overly uh, emphasized uh, in not even the historical, but the, the 
the scholarly importance that gets down to mistakes that scholars did. And so other scholars just say, ah, oh, you were wrong, uh, neglecting the cultivation of a proper military historical culture. And I say this not just because they like to ramble, as the more perceptive among you have already noticed, but because um, Pyrrhus is actually a very uh, underrated figure in, in this whole picture. From one side, just generally for, I think, like the, the broader political and cultural background that he represents, uh, just as a single historical figure, everybody knows him, but what was he really about, right? There is a very intense history. Like you have to study all, in detail, the uh, Epirot, Macedonian campaigns. Like it, it's, it's a lot of stuff. That's where you realize um, of which sub the man was made, right? Instead, uh, the, most people instead know the, the elephants, uh, the, this, you know, the, the saying, uh, the clash against Rome, uh, but even there, objectivizing the individual. Uh, however, there is also another aspect why um, he's underrated that I think is one of the uh, best, uh, as, as a historical subject, not the poor Pyrrhus that, of course, had, that was not poor at all and was actually one of the greatest, in fact, figures uh, in ancient history, um, is, uh, can, can be a very important litmus Best uh, for, in fact, the whole Hellenistic art of war, and one of the ancient world altogether. Why? Because Pyrrhus um, lived uh, off of a huge reputation, historiographically speaking, that began in his own times, as we will see now, because he was the author of a very important treatise on the art of war of the many that unfortunately we lost from the ancient world, and that in combination with his deeds made him uh, literally the second greatest commander in all times, according to the rankings of, as we'll see now, and if you know the, the episode, uh, it's not a surprise, of course, St. Hannibal, um, uh, Scipio Africanus, Antiochus III, uh, that were essentially also the, the generation after Pyrrhus in a Say at least broader sense of great commanders uh, and generals uh, after Alexander the Great himself, right? And uh, many people debate about this. Uh, we're not interested much in that. We're interested, of course, in what the ancients say per se. Um, nevertheless, I've had back in the day, and as you could see in that aforementioned video of the say Legion versus Phalanx studied Pyrrhus' battles against the Romans, specifically. And I... There are also, in fact, the, the more famous in his military career, more important, there is no doubt, right? And the ones that sparked a bit of a, you know, of an interest for the alleged implementation of, in fact, the traditional Hellenistic art of war. Don't get me wrong, we, we do know that uh, that aforementioned reputation revolved uh, around, and you know, things are more, even if still often anecdotally, especially in the absence of the knowledge of the actual content of his work, the art of castramitation, to use sort of Latinate terminology, so the, the art of encampments, that Pyrrhus would have improved, refined, uh, sophisticated. Now, today's video will be in part acknowledging Pyrrhus' deeds, right? His life is too dense of historical events to make a properly evidential uh, introduction to that, right? As well as his military exploit, right? We will not talk, for example, much about his Sicilian campaign. I mean, the guy was the, the full pack of great commander. There is no doubt he was a military genius. He had really an incredible, uh, in fact, was a divine background. There is no doubt about this. There was no doubt among his contemporaries. That's also where his uh, enormous reputation stemmed from, right? Because his military deeds were clear. However, that's also the twist, right? It, that's the actual 
criticism, the actual question of someone defeated by Victor, how effective his means really were, and how much, especially what we think he actually improved, um, is uh, historically reconstructable. This is not to say to deny it in the case we, we, we can't do it, for example. And what is, in fact, that, that we actually know about such implementation? Because this is a, a, a narrative. That I addressed this towards the end of the video about the Hellenistic, uh, the introduction to the Hellenistic art of war. Um, there's this idea, especially in the later phase of the Hellenistic era, not much period of times that, as you know, was sort of, of an in-between, but that actually is uh, referred to, for, for the reasons we will see now, specifically the alternation of the spare eye of Macedonian pikemen and, say, Italic mercenaries. That, that's that's the actual thing, um, which I personally, it's not, I don't find extraordinary in order to achieve that, you must be a great commander and everything, but it's it's not a tactically revolutionary thing. Um, there is plenty of, uh, I, I mean, not so plenty, but there are examples uh, telling us that Paris was not the only one doing that, um, but even more that, generally speaking, that's sort of the most obvious and probably mandatory thing that any commander sh could have done at that point, given especially his manpower shortage, um, especially against the, in fact, the, the, the Pyrrhic victories against the Roman legions. And so there is a bit this mythology um, surround, mostly based on hearsay, on voices or whatever, that however do not objectivize what we actually know about this ruler, that you can't, I personally admire enormously just from his effective and immensial history, his actual political and military um, achievements, uh, if taken as a, just as a man, right, and then perfectly fitting with the overall idea of, of, of the major failure that his memory is also connected with. And there is a lot of in-between that I hope we can start discussing, because I don't talk about uh, Hellenistic warfare, and even more Hellenistic history, that much. But definitely, it's one of those fields in which you should go, first of all, very uh, carefully, um, and, um, and explore bit by bit, uh, which may uh, preclude you from having some sort of broader picture of, I could insert some Hellenistic further Hellenistic content in the in the cycle uh, but that in fact does deserve to be understood as something a bit detached almost in a divine sense uh, from the more regular military history that we discuss because we're talking really about giants here and so we should be also very humble in the way we judge uh, and mostly doing it on a historical basis not much on some sort of a way of say reconstructing things that really weren't right the idea of this the flexibilization of the antigonid uh, uh phalanx simply because they they used you know assault infantry skirmishes on tough ground right or i don't remember what was there um some there are actually also some underrated aspects of the, like the the maneuvering capacities of the phalanx of battles like uh, the Thermopylae not that the Mopuli, as you know, we're talking the, the Roman Seleucid War, the, the same battle of Magnesia that is somehow underrated. Other uh, aspects like Pyrrhus mix of spare of different troops, phalanx or not, for holding the main line of heavy infantry, doesn't seem, it, it is an achievement, is an important feat, but first of all, isn't it like a, an actual depletion, and especially the consequence of an actual depletion, in fact, of the phalanx itself, and so what, what is there in Hellenistic warfare, um, in a, at least in, in that narrow sense of Hellenistic warfare, you can argue that the greatest Hellenistic general in a conceptual sense was Hannibal, because he truly surpassed even, in fact, what the hammer and anvil, right, uh, of, of Macedonian warfare had essentially established as a major, um, uh, as a major foundation in Western warfare, but uh, even in that, by the way, like the Persians did quite admirable things for quite a while. They had been far more advanced than, than the Greeks, say, at the time of the Persian Wars, and yes, you can be defeated even in that sense. And so I, I think that 
we are um, technicizing a bit too much this Mills historical analysis on the basis of data that we also do not dispose of. And that taking an analogy of also like what trying to find alternative solutions, the question is, you know, how many other ways was there to do that? And so what kind of innovation does this actually constitute? Right, that, that, it, it's very easy to spot people who do not really have much um, of an idea about the art of war exactly because they do not seem to understand that certain um, solutions at times are, are not an option, right? Or just, especially in larger engagements, just very few things you, you can do. Admittedly, they are difficult to do and take such enormous generals, but in a sense, we should appreciate mostly that leadership quality as opposed to a solution that is also not um say particularly complex but it is if anything difficult to to accomplish which is another thing and so not in this case like an intrinsic quality of of the fact like we are very much obsessed uh or at least the influence put it this way um by polybius accounts of the phalanx that is very in that case, it's actually very, say, uh, ideal, right, for very specific purposes. That's yet another example. People attribute to Polybius such a great military expertise, especially in the clash between the, the phalanx and the legion. But actually, the guy, first of all, never probably even saw them uh, in action against one another, but, like, uh, was not even necessarily writing to provide uh, at least a fully... Uh, say a, a type of explanation that fits with our own modern secular mentality even though he is definitely that relatable and he has that mind it's so similar to us but the, the context in which he was writing is more important than uh, what you sort of want to squeeze out of it because yes Polybius was more intelligent than you um, so you have to be careful about what he says so Tolkien Pyrrhus uh, enormous enterprise here very difficult I will just stick to some points to make the thing more digestible it was definitely uh, r renowned uh, as an unmatched military strategist an exceptionally adept leader also a sophisticated diplomat anagraphically we're talking 219 to 272 uh, Pyrrhus is often remembered as a man risking to lose a war despite winning battles and actually doing so if we uh, understand the Clausewitzian subordination of war to politics one of the best examples of the kind of so, so that's not of a lack of technical skill quite the contrary these men were mastering the more advanced military school of the time, but um, miscalculating, in a sense, the magnitude, right, of the uh, of the predictably incalculable, but also uh, much more complex situation that would have, and that such, for example, like things like invasion of Italy would have produced, like. Um, molesting a hornet nest there um, and that could definitely also succeed right? it was not a general mistake right? but definitely for someone that uh, like all Hellenistic generals wanted to leave um, in the wake of Alexander's deeds um, immediately realized to, to have fallen short um, as Alexander's deeds would never really be achieved in that broader political and strategic sense. Now, it, it is interesting that Pyrrhus, in this sense, was considered by the greatest commanders of the era as, in fact, the second after Alexander in that same ranking. Pyrrhus' remarkable strategic capabilities allowed him to address the shortcomings of Hellenistic warfare, for sure, just we do not know by which exact degree um, and also leading, in fact, to impressive victories on the battlefield. 
uh, that have to be appreciated, if anything, for the fact that they were victories to begin with, regardless of how much that tactical balance would um, sort of benefit to the, the broader strategic one. Hannibal and Scipio, uh, the, the Africans, so to say, met face to face on two occasions. You can debate whether that was true, I don't care, I've always thought that they, they did actually meet on both occasions, you know where. Uh, their first encounter occurred in 202 BC on the eve of the Battle of Zama. Um, I don't think that people that uh, claim the, the non-existence of the Battle of Zama have very sound cerebral capacities, and that's exactly the, the point I was making before. Um, there is a context in uh, historiography. Like, lots of people are not just paranoid um, and superstitious, but fundamentally are going go as far as believing that, you know, history is something, you know, just existing in a vacuum. And that so if a historian wrote about something happened, uh, it may have not been true because it's just the historian right <laughs> it wasn't sort of a background that would allow for that actual um, event, even just in in, li in line of plausibility. And so they nest into the self sabotaging and you know mental the disturbation side of the story. Naturally, the Battle of Zama did exist. Scipio emerged victorious over Carthage. That's, if anything, how the Romans secured their their position in the Western Mediterranean uh, that allowed Carthage to be later destroyed and, in the meanwhile, also to pass on the, to the, the Macedonians that had backed, in fact, the Punics at that point, fear, being fearful of Roman expansionism. Um, Nine years after Zama, so you know, quod ego fuit ad transmenum ad canas hodio tu es, right? If you know the line, if you know Latin at least, you, you can understand what that is. I don't need to translate it for you. Nine years later, Hannibal and Scipio met again in a more relaxed environment at the palace of King Antiochus III of Syria. At that time, Hannibal served, as you know, as a military advisor in the East, while Scipio visited uh, as an ambassador uh, of the Senate. Uh, you know, the, the context, uh, we talked about the Battle of Magnesia before. Uh, essentially, these were all great leaders that had been fighting against one another. As you know, in the aforementioned battle, there was an exchange of courtesies between Scipio and Antiochus the third the great, yet another one of the greatest uh, Hellenistic commanders in, in history uh, that would eventually place Scipio in trouble to a degree. I made a video uh, about the trial against the Scipiones, the Africanus' ultimate exile from Rome, etc. Um, in any case, that's mostly a Roman thing, but in, in this international arena, in this at the court, the Seleucid court uh, of Antioch, uh, these three great uh, minds, more than else, uh, met, like the manifestation of their power, especially of the rising Roman uh, hegemony. This significant meeting between such formidable leaders was, as you know, documented by the Hellenic historian Plutarch, as well as the Roman historian Levi. During their conversation, Scipio inquired of Hannibal, whom he considered the three greatest generals in history. Hannibal's response ranked Alexander the Great first, obviously, followed by Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, and finally himself, Hannibal. The spicier part was, of course, uh, the condition of this ranking, that is to say, what historically happened. In fact, Hannibal said, had I defeated you, Scipio, at Zama, I would have actually been not the second after Alexander, it would have been greater than Alexander, which is actually not much of a display of arrogance from the side of Hannibal, consider, as I was hinting at before, that there are doubts about the historicity of this encounter, and even more, of course, of the actual um, speeches that would have been held uh, between uh, these 
uh, the, these giants. Um, it, this is a, an hyperbole, you know, that at Zama things were not so. Um, they were, the odds were balanced as always in great engagements, but of course Hannibal had a sort of scrap force, right? He had just a reserve of veterans he could play with sort of broader tactics with cavalry wings and so on. But Scipio had the the better army, right? In that sense, uh, an advantage. Nevertheless, so uh, there is no greater alchemy behind what Hannibal could actually do. He he did basically the only thing he could do in that array, right? And that's exactly the, the point, right? This was not his army of Cannae, right? That's exactly what that previous statement also entailed to a degree. Um, the um, uh, the the tactical options are limited, right? If you don't have an infantry uh, uh, trained for carrying out flank attacks, like you know Hannibal's veterans in Italy, the the Libo Phoenician troops in particular um, could uh, you could definitely couldn't do it with the Carthaginian militia right on the plains of North Africa. So uh, that's not even, you see how much that phrase can be distorted depending on how much you miss from the broader background. But what of course stands out for today's topic is the aforementioned placing of Pyrrhus after Alexander is the greatest commander in history. Right. And while recognized as a master tactician today, Pyrrhus is not typically affiliated with grand conquests or impressive military achievements. Unfortunately, because he did really score a lot, if you study again, especially his uh, Balkan enterprises, that there is a lot there. Uh, instead, he is primarily known for his in fact, so-called Pyrrhic victories against the Romans. Those outcomes that bear a closer resemblance to defeats than to triumphs. Uh, especially in a tactical sense. Strategically, this is true actually for uh, the whole enterprises that Pyrrhus uh, uh, took under, let's say, that um, there were many successes, especially in the Atlantic mainland, but that were, however, still perturbed by the volatile political situation. In fact, they could never fully take over mass and without continuing to fight eventually die so that also is to be considered in, in a broader of course also political sense uh, a failure right that, that sort of idea of pure stands out the most in, in this for, for this enormous endeavors that eventually led nowhere he, he would have had to reconquer the entire dominion of Alexander and he basically didn't manage to um, go beyond a, a regional dimension. So that even the the victories slash defeats against the Romans seem actually minor in comparison to, to that. And they weren't minor at all. Uh, Hannibal provided further and extensive insight into the reasons for his high regard for the king of Epirus. He claimed that Pyrrhus was the first to master the art of encampment, as we remember before. They, knowing where and how to arrange troops effectively as well, no one had chosen a battlefield or deployed forces with greater wisdom than Pyrrhus. Furthermore, Pyrrhus had a unique ability to win over the hearts of men, which seems uh, a major le uh, leadership quality to such an extent that as you know um, the Italiotes especially but also many Italics preferred the rule of a foreign king to that of the Romans who had long held sway over the land I made last year an extensive video explaining the, the, the striking the, the ultimate as complete success of Rome and especially of her, in fact, Romano-Italic confederacy, um, throughout all these engagements, like the 3rd century BC is when Rome starts entering, in fact, the international arena and facing off this formidable opponents, the, the full might, in fact, of Alexander's legacy in Pyrrhus, that he really was. Um, 
and still, in fact, after a generation or two later, Pyrrhus was viewed as an undeniable authority in military strategy uh, itself. The merit granted this too was the fact that he, he authored one of the earliest treatises on the subject, which was undoubtedly popular and studied by both Hannibal and Scipio. Consider this, although, and yet yeah, we, we know this, it has unfortunately been lost to history. Uh, it's speculative to wonder what could have been written in this work specifically and how this would have concretely influenced the art of war, the one of the same Romans and the Carthaginians were evidently studying from. Um, as uh, suggested by Hannibal's remarks, we can surmise that Pyrrhus' work explored in-depth themes that would become pivotal in the annals of warfare anyway. The selection of optimal locations for encampments, methods for con constructing those camps, strategies for identifying the most favorable terrain for battle, and the deployment of troops in preparation for combat itself. Pyrrhus practically understood um, let's say that an encampment was not merely a temporary resting place for troops, it was a vital component of the entire military apparatus. It could safeguard against nighttime raids and surprise attacks while serving as the storage for soldiers' possessions and essential supplies. The question is, however, uh, wasn't this obvious? Right? It's not like encampments were invented by Pyrrhus. So the idea here seems rather than Pyrrhus, of course, perfectioned this um, and attributed to encampment a greater relevance than before, I would say in some sort of apparently defensivistic fashion, not that he was particularly a defensivist himself, nor that his campaigns suggest that he ever did anything wrong with, with encampments specifically, otherwise he would have not even enjoyed such a high reputation on that. He was very experienced, he fought most of his life, he was uh, overthrown quite early in time, he had to fight for his throne and he made back and forth across uh, Greece um, many many times um, so he just had a very strong concrete capacity if um, later authors attribute uh, via Hannibal rapidly so uh, this um, particular capacity of Pyrrhus uh, to to implement on castramentation we have to deduce that either he sort of um, implemented this in parallel with uh, the toughening of the broader art of war, right? Politics were becoming definitely less primitive. Uh, you had this emerging nations like um, the Romano-Italic Confederacy. You had also difficult terrains were to operate like uh, the same masses and the pairs. You know, there were mountains in between. Um, Pyrrhus operated in southern Italy, in Sicily, that were heavily urbanized because of the Atlantic and also the Carthaginian uh, in fact, uh, fortification. Think about the siege of Eryx, this uh, apparently impregnable location that Pyrrhus managed to, to storm. Right? If anything, he failed at the siege of uh, Lilibium because the uh, Sicilios wouldn't pay for a fleet to blockade it from the sea otherwise again the Carthaginians would have been completely out of Sicily um, the other option is that um, and this is possible considering also what we see here as the, the limit of essentially regional boundaries compared to the universal ones of Alexander the fact that um, the art of war had lost that um, sort of Apollonian capacity to break through for whichever reason, like the time of years is over and things become more complicated, and castramentation, the reinforcement of this um, fortificatory apparatus, may have actually reflected um, um, a decrease in the elan of the Macedonian military. Right? Remember that Pyrrhus was the brother-in-law to Demetrius Polyorchetes that was uh, that was, in fact, the father of polyorcetics. That's how, uh, because of his great, um, e if anything, experience in siege warfare, uh, 
uh, he was nicknamed uh, and that fa in fact passed down to history as basically the, the builder of the greatest military machines of all times siege machinery of all time at least uh, that however earned him almost um, nothing but defeats right <laughs> and was known also uh, for in that sort of negative life form in fact so betraying through technologism through materialism if you want some higher principle of spiritual force that was for example displayed by Alexander uh, during the siege of Tyre creating a veritable isthmus um, artificially ex novo not much because of the technique per se obviously was particularly advanced but because of the sheer will to power and capacity of the megas to, to do so right so it's possible that the later historiographical tradition elaborated a bit too much on this you know camps because again the Macedons already had them there's also this anecdote that the Romans would have learned from Pyrrhus how to build camps the famous Roman camps don't get me wrong at this time it's likely that the Romans had sort of way more primitive um, encampment uh, uh, capacities than the later and famously standardized ones uh, however Pyrrhus himself is credited by arriving allegedly at the outskirts of Rome during his you know spearheading uh, maneuvers towards uh, the Urbs before withdrawing because the Romans were bringing up much forces that the Romans were not barbarians he said like he, he basically that was not bad for this kind of barbarians uh, and they um, they evidently were in a stage in their military development that we cannot assume being you know to, to the point of having to learn literally how to encounter this is also what sort of nomadic tribal peoples do definitely Rome already knew that so again yet other anecdotes that in that case are also a bit thrown around by the Romans themselves in especially in the later Republic the early Empire when they wanted to stressed that they basically had improved on what the Greeks had done, which was already sort of an, an Hellenic influence in their kind of thinking that remained, however, much more crudely primitive in a positive sense, in a positive and effective sense, even especially from a, from a military point of view, reflective of their broader culture that had defeated the Greeks, in fact. But in fact, that do not really correspond much to that practical reality right so it's really not clear uh in what say Pyrrhus could have had a specific genius in deploying troops in spawning the right uh place for encampment etc but we are just speaking of a of a reputation that was that remained historically and that however we do not see any specific uh say quantity to compare, say, to other generals, it may be like some. Uh, again, if you study his campaigns, it was a very competent way of handling. But if it, what, like, uh, imagine we we didn't have this anecdotes. It's not like we would have studied Pyrrhus and said, "Oh my God, he was such great at placing in camp," because there is literally not a direct evidence for this kind of accomplishment, as opposed to the actual, more important political and strategical ones that he definitely knew how to accomplish. So, sure. He was a military genius, but we have to, and surely he may have had a bias in that direction, but we don't have any better evidence to substantiate this, to observe it from from the close, right? Um, time comes when the student surpasses the master. Um, the encampment, in fact, became a military target for adversaries. That's always the point. Warfare is not that definitive. It's not just because you know how to build camps or to locate them that, you know, things are solved. We won the war. We're okay. Everything's fine. The others are stupid. We are just... Uh, that's not how war works. Um, de definitely, uh, the camp could serve as a crucial stronghold where the defeated troops could seek refuge, but in that case, uh, it's more like a preventive measure, and you do not want to be in that situation to test that uh, sure you can prevent the retreat from devolving into a route but normally right normally if an entire army is destroyed um, there is a very few that even the camp can't do 
We have seen it in many in many examples. Starting from the basics, the camp, in order to fulfill its potential effectively, could not merely be a haphazard arrangement of tents and makeshift huts. It required specific technical features. For, for instance, it needed a protective palisade, meticulous construction order, and a set of established principles to regulate its internal organization. If you look at the Amphipolis uh, regulations that are basically the only comparable uh, Hellenistic military manual regarding disciplinary issues to say the, the Roman ones, like uh, a guy called to sleep and watch was just basically fined, the Romans put him to death, right? So even in this case, you know, it, it's not about build, knowing how to build a camp, but part of something else, right? And we can see how Pyrrhus may have, in fact, uh, regularized because of his long-term military experience, like camps, in a way that may have, for example, even inspired the Romans to standardize their own, but it's something that we can't properly demonstrate or track in a definitive sense, things devil gradually, and there is no much uh, of a way to, 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 to track that. Um, of course, in a strategic sense, the choice of location was critical. Not just strategic, but also logistically. It had to be situated near forests for firewood, for example, water sources, even more, taking into account various strategic characteristics that differed from one landscape to another, from one enemy to another, in, from one situation to another. In his writings, Pyrrhus addressed these issues with remarkable insight, apparently, and was particularly adept at implementing his own recommendation. His designs may have definitely influenced Roman military encampments, which over the centuries became a fundamental aspect of Roman military strategy, so just after an important uh, while. Now, as for Alexander the Great, he not only solidified but also celebrated in the ancient world the noted military reforms introduced by his father, Philip II. Philip developed the concept of combined arms, at least in Western warfare, uh, narrowly meant, which emphasized the importance of coordinating the actions of different troop types to enhance their effectiveness and compensate for their respective weaknesses. This was more than else an Hellenic issue because the Greeks had had the capacity to go on uh, for most of their history just with essentially uh, this, this body of heavy infantry that didn't have to mind too much about other arms that were important in Greece. Uh, that's also what the, the apolitic heresy, let's say, discusses. But, of course, as we've seen before, even just empirically, every person who studied the period knows how the thing really developed. Like, there had always been horsemen and archers, etc. But, of course, they wouldn't acquire such a, a, a great importance uh, until the, the Macedonian reforms that properly developed not much like this concept of heavy infantry line eventually supported in a broader sense, by other arms. Like, it properly introduced the concept of the, the hammer and the anvil, with the cavalry and the infantry specifically, with the latter being, yes, part of the, say, Hellenic uh, proceedings. And the pikeman was something a bit more, say, conceptually uh, different from, I don't know, even the Ficratrian one, where we're still talking about hope lies in a narrow say, classical sense, there wasn't actually sort of an evolution from Hellenic classical warfare into the Hellenistic one. They were too rigidly separated ones. If anything, however, the most important aspect was the uh, just the fact that Macedon was a feudal country, the only true feudal country in, in the West, at least in a, in a sedentary sense, as a civilized, also at a civilizational level. Uh, but in fact, the, the, this country could produce, as a consequence, a large body of heavy shock cavalry, right? And so the combined arms mostly derived from that. The Persians, as we said before, of course, made a, a very effective use of combined arms from a while. Uh, other peoples also used in their own way combined arms, right? Uh, the Romans did, the Carthaginians did um, already. 
Now, it, everything evolves to a degree that you have to compare with one another, but in this sense, we can't simply uh, author one specific uh, Mills redevelopment from, from the separating it from the rest of, of the art of war and the general influence that every people had on one another, while maintaining, of course, particular specificities, which was really, at this point, the case of the the Hellenistic, uh, and even more properly the Macedon, because we, we can talk about an Hellenistic school, as we said, the Carthaginians had, the same Romans to a degree had them, but they did not fight at all as the Macedon. So rather a, a Macedonian uh, army that was truly a bubble uh, that different from the others. And in fact, nobody else really ha ever had, right? Sometimes not even the same Macedons had it. Think about the Italians in Pergamon. They, I'm talking about Macedons broadly meant also because, as you know, the Pizzatiri were called uh, Macedonians just by um, uh, Synecdoche for the fact that it was truly the Macedons that brought uh, that on the floor because they did not have enough uh, resources to sustain it. The, the phalanx was an extremely and overwhelmingly expensive system. It was extremely effective. As also the Romans did find out, because the, the the picture there is that even though the Romans did basically win, like they did surpass, like they 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 won more than lost against the phalanx, the odds still remained overall balanced, and especially the Romans never ever broke. Their, as nobody else telling the truth, the the uh, Macedonian phalanx frontally, right? Even Pitt, now that people you know, mechanistically explained, like, how the Romans entered the gaps. The gaps were already formed. Like, Polybius is extremely explicit about that, but the broken terrain. That's what the Romans could exploit, right? You don't find it in any other battle, so you can't say, well, that's how the Romans could simply defeat the others, because if you had actually studied the other battle accounts, you would know that that's not how it happened. So that, if anything, from the perspective of somebody who studied that, you know, immediately realized that you don't know anything about the topic. In any case... This aspect, cavalry, emerged as the decisive, or at least, the, say, the dominant arm on the battlefield. Right? It was prized for its speed and unpredictability. Uh, the art of war began to favor military genius, essential for achieving victory through optimal troop deployment, for effective cooperation, and the commander's ability to deliver the decisive blow, often with cavalry, capable of shattering the enemy. Pyrrhus was very much into this. Um, the famed Macedonian phalanx armed with long pikes appeared to the enemies as an unstoppable force while providing remarkable stability to troop formations on the battlefield. However, the Hellenistic military system also had its shortcomings, which quickly became apparent to astute observers, including Pyrrhus himself. In less skilled hands than Alexander's, Hellenistic armies proved overly predictable and at times even inflexible, effective on flat terrain, but lacking the adaptability needed in hilly, wooden, or rugged areas. Most of the landscapes where battles occurred, at least say, the, the many smaller engagements that did not make it to be recorded as significant battles um, in, in the same time, simply also because we do not have an actual description of, of the engagement, and so that you do not find in the, the war games uh, disclosing texts because, um, you know, they were not a thing. But I I in order to understand uh, the art of war and knowing a military culture, you must study all of this. In fact, everybody knows about Pyrrhus' wars against Rome or the Carthaginians. But what about the ones against Macedon, the ones against the, the Diadoko in general? Those were much more intense, and then when when you also because they largely happened before the Italian uh, campaign, and and so at a time by which Pyrrhus would have been a, a veritable veteran, and uh, m having already molded most of what he would have become famous for, if anything, what we see in Italy is the uh, outcome of that background was a again a, a hell of a military school so 
there is this notion I was pointing out before that derives from the the account, the, the description of the Battle of Ausculum, where by Pyrrhus would have allegedly modified the same phalanx, so incorporating a mix of heavy infantry, more agile, say, or at least lighter troops, to create a more adaptable formation. Now, this is not correct. I mean, it happened because we have this passage by Polybius that tells us that this, that the, the we'll see the Battle of Ausculum briefly. Now and again, I actually discussed this only in that video about the uh, the Manipular Legion versus Macedonian phalanx. It was part of a of a thesis that I wrote at university uh, for a Roman history course that uh, analyzes, in fact, the single engagements between these two military systems. And Ausculum is one of the most beautiful, and you get all the information there because they're also very short accounts. Like there is not this you know, mystery behind them. They are all what we have. And so there basically you have the the notion that since the Epiros had lost so many troops at the battle the, the previous battle of Ereclea, where they had actually already deployed on some part of the line the their Italiote or Italic uh, allies, which was also completely normal, right? When you look at mixed armies, coalition armies, that's how they deployed. Pyrrhus would have, in this rugged terrain in Apulia, with, with a stream, with a forest, it was a very complicated um, ground. Th this alternation of um, essentially Oscan mercenaries that were basically like Roman legionaries, except a bit less um, collectively disciplined, nevertheless enough to remain, uh, to, to make the phalanx hold, right? Because that was the, the bloody battle that Pyrrhus said, okay, another victory like this and uh, we're 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 over with, and the and the the proverb stemmed from that, that even Cleus succeeded, and that was the alternation of this Italic infantry with the upper road to fundamentally say Macedonian uh, phalanges. Do we see this battle line being more agile? In which sense? That this is my more powerful criticism. Like agility has to do with, say, tough terrain. For example, if you study the Battle of Cunoscaphalae between the Antigonids and the Romans later on at the beginning of the second century BC, uh, which is also the first, um, you know, it's the moment in which the Romans really surpass also the trauma of Pyrrhus, really, uh, defeating especially the Macedonians on, in, the same, in the same Greece. You do have things like. I don't know, there were two real for lighter troops ahead of the actual heavy uh, phalangitic infantry that fought over a hilly forested terrain. And everybody's saying, oh my god, the Antigonids were so ahead. Look, they were making the phalanx more flexible. Like, in Alexander's times, it would have occurred. Like, they had the Thracians, they had the grain, they had this kind of troops since ever. They're, they're saying actual kingdom. Um, so... And it's not even like the sources are explicitating anything about that flexibility. We're literally told in the case of Ausculum that there was this alternation. Was this to, 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 I don't know, to flex the phalanx? No. Is there any evidence for that? No. Is there any comparative evidence or analogy? No. Zero. You have, just have what is obvious in this battle, a straight battle line. And what had happened is that the Epirodes had suffered so many losses against the Romans in the previous engagements that they needed to intersperse uh, some Italic mercenaries in, um, uh, in between the, the, the phalangitic units uh, to, to actually have a heavy infantry, a, ba a battle line, just like the Romans had. So did this have anything to do with agility or flexibility? Like, not even the Romans, like you see, it's not like the Romans, aside from their incredible moral force and general capacity to enforce a collective discipline had, in this sense, a greater flexibility. What does flexibility even mean? Like, this is what you found all pseudo-history uh, experts on Facebook groups uh, 10 years ago. It doesn't mean absolutely anything. Like, flexibility can be something like, yes, in, in a broader sense of chain of command or whatever, but just because one historian told us, like in, in the haze of Pitna, that 
the Roman seeing the Macedonian phalanx broken by itself, which is not a good sign, and definitely we do not see it in this other in this other uh, engagements. Why why don't people talk about flexibility, for example, about the the, the phalangitic square formed at Magnesia by the Seleucid, for example? Um, the, the Romans could individually say to, to because the say the maniple commanders had uh, the sentries had more initiative. Uh, rather than being necessarily something more flexible per se, to attack into the gaps, right? Also, the uh, Macedonian phalanx had units, had gaps by itself, and not the ones that you find in Pitna, uh, that because the phalanx literally broke into pieces um, that could be exploited. We're talking about the normal gaps that every single battle line has, and that have absolutely nothing to do. I made an entire video explaining this with the capacity of exploiting them. Every unit must have a space between one another. The Romans had them, Macedonians had them. And no, the Rom there is no historical units whatsoever. It also because it doesn't make any logical sense to squeeze your own unit to enter a, corrid a, a corridor between um, units that even if it were larger than the, the, uh, as the same unit would, would still place you in between the enemy and not conferring to either the two any kind of advantage. Because you're not attacking frontally. In, in, in order to, to do this, you would have had to have um, more troops than the enemy. What would the, in, in that line, and what would the enemy let that happen to begin with? So it's, it's a complete um, nonsense that um, people fixate with, and that, if anything, reveals an absolute level of any trace of strategic and military historical and military art literacy. It has nothing, it never existed, it's not real. That's not how people fight, That that's not documented historically. It's nothing, right? The sources do not tell anything of that. It's pure fantasy, uh, mental distortion from purely educated people in the 21st century. It has nothing to do with reality, with any moral or scientific evidence whatsoever. Uh, if you think that, it, it, if you fundamentally lack the basics of human combat to begin with and military logic as well now that's it you need to stiffen the, the the battle line because that's essentially what you fought on especially this is true for for the for the Macedons that have one are basically to fight with one major battle line so the Romans had the triplex Achaeus um, but this also had to be in fact this how do you you fight, right? You know, you must distribute forces in ways that we do not know because we do not know how they were distributed battle after battle. And in any case, this this is you you can compose that, right? Do you have the triplex axis all the time? Even if you have, say, more or less the same amount of troops than the enemy, then what what do you have? Do you have yes, triple line? The enemy doesn't have it. So what does it mean that you have a one third of the of the enemy front? That's not how battles work, all right? So uh, these are just war gameistic prejudices. Again, they have nothing to do with actual warfare. And so all this notion that Pyrrhus would have, I don't know, done who knows what in terms of, look, this is what the future of the phalanx was interspersing for, no, right? And also the fact that other kingdoms where the phalanx collapsed because their state was collapsing, like in Egypt, for example, or in the same Syria at some point later, um, began to use troops that looked like the Roman ones. Uh, does make sense, not just because um, the Romans at that point were sort of militarily hegemonic in the Mediterranean after having defeated the same phalanx, which of course had an influence, but because the concept of the legionnaire is the concept of any kind of warrior except in Greece. Um, that any other sedentary people uses. Every single, literally every single people in Europe and in the Mediterranean, the sedentary world uses the same identical type of trooper. It's a guy with an oval shield, with a helmet, with a j javelins slash spears, and if he's lucky, some sort of extra armor. And they all have the same identical thing, right? Do you hear about, uh, do, do you need, how, how do you think the uh, flexibility comes around? So the, the Macedons should have been defeated by any kind of troop that was not a phalanx sheet because they had a loser order, let's say, a less rigid one, which is 
not even true because if you want to face the phalanx you must to be as tough as that as a battle line the romans literally threw themselves frontally against the the the, the phalanx we know that from the Battle of Ausculum itself, because the elephants came around and it, we're explicitly told that the legionaries freaked out the vision of the elephants, that they preferred to basically impale themselves on the Macedonian, um, in fact, pikes, in order to cause as many losses as possible on the enemy, which even if it was the best way of doing it, so a frontal clash that has nothing to do uh, in terms of sort of paper, rock, scissors, uh, so you can't attack a phalanx frontally or hope to break it frontally, even though it's not documented to have eventually succeeded. Uh, because there were other smart ways to go around it. No, strategically speaking, there are in in conventional clashes there's no way. So as these pitched battles really are, there's no way to do that. It, it would make you much weaker than if you actually engage the enemy frontally. Leaving aside the fact that there are the wings of cavalry and so on, but uh, literally, in fact, in the Battle of Ausculum, there was a lot of back and forth, because at some point, the line would collapse, at some point, things would go rough, and you wouldn't know even what the hell is going on, uh, but you have cavalry, and more or less, these armies are very similar in concept between one another. We should not overly fixate about the categoristic difference between armies in the ancient world. Yes, for those times, let's say a, a Macedonian army, a Roman army, a Germanic army were sort of very different to some degree. But if you see them from, from the filter of, I don't know, contemporary warfare in terms looking at all the imbalances that we have today, you look at these peoples and you realize that they are virtually identical. They fight practically in the same way. Also because there are not many other ways you can imagine to fight in, especially if you want to maintain the upper hand. Um, so we should... I have an enormous respect for Pyrrhus. I think he's one of the most beautiful uh, figures in ancient warfare. Uh, I esteem him enormous. I think he definitely deserved his title, his reputation. Or many people would say, no, he, he couldn't be the second after Alexander. I actually think that he may have been, right, in a broader sense, also beyond the mere, strictly military side of the story. But these voices based on one author that can be so intelligent and informed, but that literally does not say what the voices say, because voices transform everything, it magnifies some certain narratives for reasons that are just in your head, not in what happened in that world. It's not good. It's not an intelligent thing. You're not rendering any service to history. You're not being smarter. You're not being more um, reliable. In other words, you're just damaging the entire enterprise. You're damaging these great characters' memories. All right. Uh, then we know that other treatises on military tactics were penned by Pyrrhus' son, Alexander, and his chief advisor was Cyneas of Thessaly. You understand how blended these cultures were? I mean, this is a broader Macedonian culture, if you want by military standards, establishing a Peiros as such as a genuine center of Hellenistic, uh, Hellenistic military thought. It was a hell of a might, like the other Diadokoi at some point curtailed uh, Pyrrhus to side with his, with them and the, the actual clash, especially against Mass. And, but he was legitimately feared. I mean, when he invaded Italy and Sicily, he definitely was there to create a major regional power that was in Pyrrhus' great mind closing to, to the one of, of the Megas, the launching pad for, in fact, reconquering the latter's empire, right? And going beyond towards India, think about the Indian elephants that surely were, were with the actual uh, Mahouts from from the subcontinent. Um, and so all, how vast, actually, the the mind, the, the range, the horizons of these people really, really were. Right. We will talk more about more elephants at some point. Um, in any case, Pyrrhus, as we've seen, excelled according to Hannibal not only in military strategy but also in another crucial quality for leadership. That is the art of winning over people. 
While he did not possess the remarkable natural charisma of Alexander the Great, nobody really can claim that, he compensated with considerable political and diplomatic acumen, and acknowledged even by his adversaries. He demonstrated these skills by systematically employing mercenaries in his army, for example, uh, including the aforementioned elephants, whose drivers likely hailed from distant India. For more importantly, he recognized the necessity of forming alliances and engaging in diplomacy, not just to resolve conflicts, but also, and perhaps more critically, to initiate and steer them to favorable outcomes, aided in this endeavor by his loyal advisor, Cunhas. Pyrrha's strategy against Rome sought to exploit the crisis triggered by Roman expansionism in Italy. Right? This chapter, if anything, is the more uh, important, the more monumental, the more fascinating, because the Romans really met at that point with Hellenistic uh, power. The, uh, the, the Macedons could, uh, at some point historically, have invaded the West. It's not like, um, not just as Pyrrhus proves, but how Alexander wanted to do, for example, with Carthage. Right, His point was uh, recruiting troops in the East to crush Carthage, basically uh, freeing, a bit like, that was also where Pyrrhus got the, the idea, but also sort of the obvious realization from, uh, liberating the uh, southern uh, Italian and Sicilian Hellenic colonies from the Punic threat. You destroy Carthage, you have at that point Phoenicia and, um, and Carthage itself as basically the, the cornerstone for a, for a naval power in the Mediterranean that cannot be challenged by anyone. And from there he would have gone to India. But had Alexander invaded, say, Italy, passing from uh, from the Balkans and to the north, he, he would have likely, at that point, especially in history, subjugated everyone. It's unlikely that even Rome would have put up much of a at least successful struggle. Um, and but simply and importantly, and as understandably. Alexander wanted India, which made a lot of sense, right? Then the rest could come later. Why bothering with this Western tribes, right? It's not so crucial. Pyrrhus is the guy that instead actually enters in that world in a time in which even these tribes had become, as we found out the hard way, uh, himself um, something else, right? So, admittedly, in southern Italy, there were, as you know, various peoples. Like, the, there was an Italic interland, and then you had the Hellenic colonies on the coast that wouldn't really extend much of their military influence beyond a few tens of kilometers. If anything, it was like this local cultures that would gradually influence the way of war of, of of the Greeks themselves. Look at the Syracusan army in Sicily, for example. They they were really um, something different. From At some point, it would be actually the strongest power in the Hellenic world, more than Sparta and, and, and Athens, uh, and also fighting in a more professional, more articulated, specialized ways, and so on. Then we will see in another video from... Roman manualistic history, of course, how the war with Pyrrhus happened. The Tarentines, Taras being, as you know, a Spartan colony uh, in southern Italy, major port, still today, presence of one of the most important naval bases in the Mediterranean, um, had um, made an agreement with Rome, whereby uh, she would have not had to send ships in the Gulf of Taurus, which the Romans start start, start doing. Uh, they also locate a, a garrison in, in Turi, that is another city that uh, Taurus destroys. And so at that point, the Romans intervene. And Taurus calls Pyrrhus, because, of course, of the common Hellenic uh, bond, 
and the fact that also many populations from the southern Italian interland, such as the Bruti and the Samnites, uh, would side with them, uh, trying to resist the dominance of Rome. You know that, essentially, after this period, the Romans managed to take over the entire Italian peninsula, and so, so much of these other peoples, the Samnites and the Bruti later, for example, would rebel to Rome during the Second Punic War, because they were sort of the more complicated to handle with, um, so a bit different from one another in terms of actual capacities, but still, like the Samnites were the only people that ever could contend the control of the Italian peninsula uh, with Rome, uh, they were strongly confederal people, they were tough warriors, but they were not really a state, and so also would become a, a permanent war machine, like the Roman um, legionary forces could, uh, could, could prove to be. The Bruti were instead probably the single most underdeveloped people in, in, in the region, living in today's uh, Calabria. And in fact, as we've seen also in the videos about Byzantine history, is was called up to uh, the High Middle Ages Brutium after the Bruti, right? The Calabria was the last, the, was like the last part of the uh, heel of the boot, what it would be today's Salento. That uh, the, the Byzantines had, in fact, um, uh, a district called Calabria that was moved at some point for. Um, say security reasons and reinstalled in Calabria so that became Calabria for, for that reason and that's all mountains and so on and they're not in fact particularly strong people Rome is already very powerful and that's why she can threaten Taurus to begin with but when Pyrrhus arrives this changes everything um, consider that Pyrrhus was already known at that point uh, for his military skills so it was just a, like a massive card um, although Pyrrhus lacked sufficient troops and resources for such an ambitious campaign because Italy was really big especially very populated right very rich in many ways so that's where the Romans were managing to harness all this um, enormous resources they are not primarily material they're actually moral right we explained where Roman superiority laid in it's a spiritual, religious reason. Right? There is no other practical one. Um, Pyrrhus managed to acquire um, different uh, troops from other Hellenistic rulers plus these peoples, and so through a vast uh, uh, and influential network of alliances. Hence also how he mixed troops uh, battles like Auscul. In 280 BC, Pyrrhus landed in Italy and quickly achieved a significant victory against the Romans near Heraclea. It was a actually closely fought battle. There the Romans, I, I referred to it, I think, in my last video about the actually very high quality of Roman cavalry were able to, you know, to keep at bay the Salians that were considered as, you know, among the, the, most, uh, the most capable horsemen, especially, like, from within the Hellenistic uh, the, the Hellenistic world itself, probably the, together with the Macedons, basically being the same, I mean, actually a, a great difference between the two. The Roman infantry proved also to be particularly courageous. So this was really a, a major engagement. Pyrrhus risked his own life. Um, we don't not know even too much about what technically happened. It was a massive clash. Pyrrhus arrived, by the way, from his side with this formidable army comprising 20,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry, 2,000 archers, 500 slingers, and 20 war elephants. At Heraclea, near present-day Polycoro, he faced the troops of Publius Valerius Leveninus. The Roman soldiers, terrified by the elephants, which they had never encountered before, broke ranks, allowing the Epirote commander to claim victory and advance towards the city, but at a you know, the great cost of this great proof of Roman uh, capacity. And that's where he immediately realized that the Romans were not going to uh, to break that easy. Shortly thereafter, Pyrrhus wisely focused, in fact, on ending the conflict through diplomacy, seeking an agreement with his adversaries. He entrusted this delicate task to the experienced and astute Kines, who, as Plutarch 
Tales endeavor to understand Roman society and discern the virtues of their government by engaging with its most esteemed members. Cuneus, who was in the Roman Senate, reported back to Pyrrhus, explaining that this institution appeared to him as a council of kings. I remember what kings were. We talked a lot about sacred royalty, and especially for a much more monarchic people like uh, the Macedons, this this really was, right? And, and so Pyrrhus as an Hellenistic monarch really being struck by the fact that uh, a people could be so united uh, for kings to essentially share power against one another. Those, of course, were the the godfathers of the, the various uh, Roman houses, that especially at this point, before the the, the bloodbath of Cannae, etc., were some of of the, the purest, like nobility, or probably racially speaking, stocks of the, the finest clan leaders, warriors uh, tempered by centuries of relentless warfare and all that evolution that Rome had undergone with its shocking development. Um, thus, Cuneus warned that confronting the Romans would be akin to battling the Lernaean Hydra, uh, a reference to the fact that the Romans could feel so many troops at once more than else. Um, in fact, the consul had already gathered at that point double the number of soldiers compared to those in previous battle, with many more Romans still able to take up arms. I remember how heavily militarized the Roman people was at this point, and how, as a consequence of the con- of the basically non-stop conquest of Italy, that at that point had brought them, in fact, to clash with the Epirodes' fear of influence. Um, and so, a victor was, was nearly a casualty. Pyrrhus' triumph at Heraclea encouraged other Italic peoples to rally to his cause, because they they understood that they could, as also fair, substantially populous groups seeking the independence that Rome would not grant them. Right? It was a great uh, political divide between Rome and the Oscans, right? They were the same people, they were all Italics, but they had developed different political systems and um, and Rome would not understand even humiliations like the one of the Caudine Forks, etc. For them, like, everything was obvious, right? Rome was to conquer the world, whereby the Oscans wanted simply to preserve their own liberty, um, also together with one another, and so they wouldn't be able to essentially structure a power that could cope with Rome in that unitarily traditional Catholic sense. Uh, it would be interesting that the, the, the Samnites could defeat Rome together with other Italian peoples, but uh, at that point there would have not been a Roman Empire, it would have not been like a Samnitic Empire, right? Things would have gone differently because of the rigid cultural divide between these people in a political sense. Um, how, when attempts to negotiate with the Romans faltered, the only recourse left to the Apei roads was to resume hostilities, albeit with a waning hope that the coalition could overwhelm the Urbs. In fact, the Roman Senate was compelled to deploy no fewer than four armies, one against the Etruscans, one against the Samnites, because these were still hoping to regain sound autonomy, then a reserve to protect Rome, and another to confront Pyrrhus' formidable forces. This this is what brought to the, first of all, to the Pyrrhic retreat from from Rome um, across Campania. Like there is this this is yet another episode that Pyrrhus did see Rome from the distance and commented on the the marvel of it. Um, and uh, the other major battles, with the one I was talking about before that basically ended up by exhaustion of the two contendants rather than any clear cut like a victory. And that's where we call it Pyrrhic victory from, from the Epirote side. It's the Battle of Ausculum. Modern day Ascoli Satriano in Apulia, where there is an Ascoli, as you know, I made a video about that among the, the medieval Italian communes in the marches in uh, in central Italy, that's a different thing. It was fought in two hundred seventy nine BC. So it was a very intense, like this, the first clash with Rome, then things would continue after the Sicilian expedition, but these were the first 
you know, how they sort of tested one another and they immediately understood that, you know, it was like a very hard endeavor for both sides. In fact, this battle in 279 was prolonged and brutal, resulting in the loss of 6,000 Roman soldiers and 3,500 for Pyrrhus, who thus lamented at that point another victory like this and we're ruined, we're done for. The heavy casualties shook his confidence in achieving outright victory. And he was right, by the way, that's also a great quality of his. Imagine having gone for it, um, like the Delphi Oracle had apparently uh, suggested him to, to go help Tyrus to fight uh, Rome. Um, but he was able to say no, right? So uh, the, the dream of subjecting Rome ultimately eluded him. By the way, some troops, uh, as you know, from the Oscan mercenaries of Pyrrhus would come back to Greece exactly in the, in the same years of the Gallic invasion. So this is the moment in which the so-called Tureos spreads in uh, Hellenic warfare uh, to at least a greater degree than before. And uh, it was this actually smaller one than, let's say, the, the big Romano-Italic and Celtic scutum that we think, in fact, is what the, the Greeks called as Tureos, right? And it was brought both by the Gauls, Sac and Greece, the same Delphi, by the way, that there may have been a connection between maybe this Pyrrhic uh, failure and that bad advice given by the Oracle, and the same Italic mercenaries that went back to, I mean, went over to to Epirus after that Rome was even at least taking over southern Italy for, for good at that point. Um, and then uh, the, the clash of Ausculum forever linked Pyrrhus' name to victories that came at, a, at an exorbitant cost, foreshadowing the inevitable catastrophic defeat, which was somewhat tarnished, um, which has somehow tarnished Pyrrhus' legacy over time. Uh, and so after years of war, the decisive confrontation uh, occurred in 275 near present day Benevent, that was apparently called Malevent at the time, and the Romans changed the name because of the victory. So a good event rather than a bad one. Um, that is also a less um, satisfying battle, if anything, because it was less spectacular. It was fought over a hill where the, the, the Epirotes had encamped, which, as we've seen also, was um, what the Romans were not scared by. So the guy was top for that, but the Romans wanted to literally attack uphill. And this is one, if you look at all these battles, everything is, like, it, it does seem like the, the Epirotes are the stronger ones, right? In this clash, for example, it's the, the Epirote elephants that are turning against the same Epirotes to cause havoc and allow, if anything, Pyrrhus to survive and come back, etc., but essentially to suffer so many other losses that they had to be out of Italy. Um, and so... Uh, this was an actual victory from the Roman side, but also, even there, uh, uh, you know, just a quite costly one from the Roman side. The difference being that Rome could afford that cost, and so this was would have not been a pyrrhic victory for Rome, right? Whereas Pyrrhus um, understood that there wasn't much that could be done anymore uh, in, the, in this front and came back home, right? And so for, for his contemporaries, the greatness of the sovereign who dare to challenge Rome remain unparalleled. If anything, because of this almost, um, I can't say sh necessarily chivalric uh, approach to warfare, etc., but the notion that this incredibly ferocious and brutal wars had been a great elegant duel between the might of Rome and the one of Macedon, I say Macedon because you know what I mean. Of course, this was a Paris, was not Macedon, but say that the Macedonian legacy uh, and the proximity of the same cult, and say that the kin, uh, the kindred uh, culture here from the Epirot side uh, really reflected um, like what, in fact, would have occurred in the Mediterranean later on, as when Pyrrhus was leaving Italy. He also uttered this ominous words, that is to say, like, what a, what a great battlefield I leave. 
um, to the Carthaginians and to the Romans, because exactly in Sicily, as we were looking at recently uh, with the Battle of Cape Economus at sea, um, uh, the the region would have become, in fact, a major battleground for these two contendants, and Rome took off in a very quick time at that point, also at sea, which you know up to that point had not really been much of a great power, but showing, in fact, how more mature than what the Romans eventually, regarding this anecdotes about Pyrrhus teaching them to encampment, etc., they really already were, right? And so, if anything. This war was, as always, like like a more of a moral, spiritual testing, rather than a technical one, right? It was about it was also about that, of course, but it was between mature peer cultures, like so. Um, the ones that we uh, we should also tend to recover beyond what the same Romans said, because the Romans sort of belittled themselves at this point in, later on by stressing the fact that they were less, and so that they uh, uh, sort of defe uh, defeated people by beating them at their own game, right? And it's not, in fact, that the Romans were winning just because they had to win. They, they definitely uh, uh, accomplished a clamorous defeat that really showed the, the ultimate superiority of their own civilization. Um, just the, the notion that this have, would have been through uh, some sort of technical aspects rather than moral ones is is also what paradoxically the Romans inverted later on uh, to in fact almost not necessarily mock the Greeks but showing saying their own language how they had defeated them because Hellenistic warfare between uh, in fact massive siege engines war elephants seated chariots always appeared like, okay, we have to master this universal power uh, that has so many faces, so many capacities and resources. But at the end of the day, um, it was the Romans in their uh, also great technical adaptability, but also much greater moral primitiveness that man and in some cases also in fact material one that really managed to take over the entire system uh, and to, in fact, at that point, definitely implementing on some Hellenistic technologies that, however, were sort of the gold standard at that point, uh, adapting them for their own, to, to the great military that Rome had become at that point. It's a, that, that was obviously like a, like a natural process rather than this huge, you know, eureka kind of accomplishment, right? So it's... Um, uh, as we're, we're seeing it for the, the Battle of Cape Economus, right? In, indeed, the Romans built up a naval force that even in, technically wise was able to cope with the Carthaginian ones, but their actual superiority was more on nature. And so we should actually recover that, explaining that moral superiority also does come through technical superiority, but as a mean effect of... of um, of the former, with the latter being a minimum of the former, and not in fact the end point or where the thing is objectively substantiated without a greater traditional horizon. So you understand how much just from this dialectical introduction to Pyrrhus' legacy and accomplishments you can um, you can acquire the siege of Argus. He was fighting a, a, against an Argive soldier and the manner of the soldier because the, the the battle was in the city streets through a major brick on Pyrrhus neck that was broken and so apparently like he was unconscious he fell from his horse and a pretty agitated uh, Macedonian soldier was with him looking at his face like we can't imagine how he would have looked decided to cut his head which was not a very appreciated gesture in general but perhaps put um, Pyrrhus out of his miseries in a much more, um, at least, uh, much less painful way than the one he would have had to suffer in that condition. And um, so this uh, this is a bit the beauty of Pyrrhus. It, it's, it, he's an enigma, right? The, the fact that 
such an enormous commander that was that had this enormous reputation was apparently a military genius capable of illustrating the same war through his works was capable of, of looking at the world of knowing the strengths and weaknesses of different peoples having such an ambitious versatile uh, mentality such a great adaptability as also the outschooling example shows would end without having accomplished like without having left essentially a legacy if not in a exemplificative way right the Paris as you know was uh, a kingdom and then it would collapse by the time of the Roman conquest it was just basically a um, federation of cities right as if Pyrrhus had exhausted that epirote potential what is fascinating is also we'll see it better in other videos this mixed background like between a Paris a Macedon the the Illyrians the same Hellas um, it, plus the, the context with, with these other cultures with Magna Graecia the the Italic peoples Carthage uh, also the the Asian the Adokoi so a, a veritable universe like the one that Alexander had in fact created with this sword and had allowed the Greeks to mold uh, with their own mind that uh, such a great mind definitely that Pyrrhus incarnated uh, in his enormous military deeds and accomplishments but it's only when you study also the determination and the resilience but and this is I think I think this the great it's the greatness of the figure the capacity of understanding when uh, there wasn't there was nothing that he could do right at least on that side of the story right in, in in the West uh, to to use those resources to eventually simply uh, launch an invasion of the East I respect enormously this figure I think he's one of the greatest indeed commanders in the ancient world and uh, he's one whose military exploit but must be studied in fact much more in depth uh, for their enormity their uh, comprehensive character not much not much for just anecdotes um, that are beautiful but must be contextualized um, in the in fact the, the times and places in which the sources uh, provide them to us uh, and that uh, in fact must make us accept that much of this uh, apero legacy is uh, is a no so we have to be able to read through the lines when possible and especially understanding the greatness of of a ruler that was really imagine like being nicknamed the eagle and fighting against like in the, of course in the broader indo-european culture against yet another people like rome that is the, the definitive eagle um uh, already at this point and um and having this very strong blood connection with Alexander himself this connection with divinity think about very important places the temple of Zeus Dodonaeus um, there were so many important cities in a Paris and Brachia for example um, so there's a lot of history there to recover you know most of this territory lays in today's Albania and there those guys have to recover from communism still in their historiographical uh, of course it's not like we can discover too much about um, Pyrrhus uh, just to but archaeology can also m make us closer to that actual um, epirote world that we at the end of the day mentioned just for Pyrrhus and we sort of don't understand like why did for example a country like this produce such a great commander that's this question you have to pose yourself there is a lot in terms of that blend between modernity and tradition between the the more advanced Macedon and this sort of more half sort of barbarian kind of world or half Illyrian to, to an exile half Hellenic half Illyrian um, that um, uh, that was even con despised but for example by the Macedons at some point Pyrrhus was understood to be almost a foreign um, monarch right in his struggles over that land and so um, there is perhaps 
also a way to understand why he was so sporty with the Romans, why he accepted the situation uh, and uh, withdrew from Italy and went on with, with his life and his ambitions in another way, incapable of adapting. That's a great quality in a man, I think. Uh, for the rest, it's just so great to look at his campaigns in order to point out the limits instead of, for example, other peoples who did not understand what was going on, like, for example, the Sicilians that really um, um, threw everything away. I mean, they, they could oust the Carthaginians and being under at least a Greek ruler. Instead, they ended up being under Rome later uh, and also becoming a battleground. We found the Carthaginians in Rome before that. And um, the... Let's say all, all, all what like all the losers of the situation really really suffered for this. From the other side, you have Rome. It's also very very interesting to study this history from the Roman or even the Carthaginian perspective, even though we know much less about that one. But the Romans definitely showed in the wars against Pyrrhus like what a hell of a military culture they already were. Like that was already the, the fully um, developed. Uh, Roman, uh, say, the, the fully developed manipular legion that wouldn't mature to its uh, absolute until the Second Punic War, but that in the essentials and the fundamentals was there, right, since the end of the 4th century BC. And that we will also, in fact, have to look at a bit more, more in depth in some other video. I'm preparing from over a year a video about the genesis of the manipular legion because we talked a lot about archaic, um, Roman warfare, but there is this step, like why did the Romans, for example, come up with the manipulator legion? Why why did it work like that? Like was it why was it like that? And what were also in there the limits? Right? The thing I care about the most as a specialist in tactics is leaving you with this idea that you can be a great commander without finding two innovative solutions. Right? Uh what's uh the phalanx could be uh, was just the phalanx. So uh, you have a, a, a battle line. You lack soldiers. There's nothing strange to to use different um, units, right? Interspersed among. By the way, we do not even know exactly how that the proportion really was between Oscan mercenaries and the Macedonian phalanges at Ausculum, right? So um, it's even just a note. It's important. But we shouldn't overly fixate on that. If anything, um, the greatness of, of that battle stands in the tenacity of the contender. It was an incredibly bloody one, and it, one of the goriest, like one of the like more hardly fought. And, and so, at some point, we'll sh we shall make a video about that too, right? Very well. We will keep talking about Pyrrhus, Epirus, There is so much about this military history is worth recounting for today however i stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye